Hi hi and welcome back to my acoustic panel diary. This is video two of the two-part series. Um, the link is in the description down below. Please go watch that first to get yourself up to speed on where we're at. Uh, you might notice that there is a different computer screen behind me to the previous video and in comparison to all of the other footage you're about to see. I'll get into that a little bit later after you've seen the rest of the video. Alright. So, I finally got my material delivered, and it is this colour. This beautiful colour. Aubergine. I've only got three more to wrap. I had to cut it down to size because I could only get it in 137 centimetres when I needed 93. But, this is how they look together. I don't think that's going to be that jarring in the room and I'm just gonna have to figure out a nice place to put them so that they kind of tile well uh, without being just like a whole bunch of red ones and then one purple one I think that would be a bit weird but yeah I'm just gonna see if I can knock over these three today and uh, then it's all basically just mounting from that point exciting Why? <laughs> Cut it out! <laughs> Basically, in order to fit the panels, we need to get rid of this ceiling fan. Because once we put those panels in, there's not really going to be that much space to pull air through. So we're off to go get a new light fitting, um, which will uh, change a bit of the look of the room, but the whole room's going to look different anyway. Which should be fun! And... Uh, maybe get something that can spread more light around the room. I don't know. More light is good. Okay, so we got a bit of energy last night and uh, skipped ahead a fair bit. I'm sorry I didn't feel it. F f film it. But we came up with a final way of hanging the panels and we hung some. Yay! They are finally up on the walls. They're so big. Um, so we still got to do this corner because uh, we hit a snag and because we were high energy, it's not quite long enough. But as you can see, the process is pretty straightforward. What we've done is eye hook up in the corner attached to this batten and we have the jack chain just hex screwed straight in to the poplar with a really chunky screw, uh, which I'll show you what that is in a second. Uh, we've just attached the batten to the wall, we've pre-painted, and that's just screwed right into the studs along the wall, and these are just holding straight away. And as for the corner, we're doing the exact same thing, we just have the hooks sitting out like this. You can see it's not exactly perfectly aligned, but I can kind of jimmy it around and it'll work, I reckon. Uh, but, yay! Finally! And it's already sounding so much better in here. I don't know if you can already tell, but uh, let's see how it actually sounds just with these five panels up. You can already hear... Hang on, if I close the door... All of a sudden that ring's gone. And that's just with five panels. We've only got like 31 more to put in. No. 30. Maths. But for now, uh, I'm just going to continue setting up this one. Uh, we're going to, to extend this batten out a bit by uh, just putting a batten on top. That's about 700 mil long. And then matching a 700 mil one for the one that's going to hang below here. And we're going to have two panels like this. But I'm excited because I have acoustic panels in my room. Finally, after months. Yay! Also forgot to mention a uh, best bit about the ones on this wall here and the way they're placed is uh, because it's my bed. I don't get a headache. Even if I sit right up, it's like just perfect height, even in the corners. 
That's what I was worried about. I was worried about getting a headache sitting up in bed. But everything fits, even like a favorite box. Not sponsored, but uh, yeah, it fits good and stuff. And I'm happy. And it actually sounds really nice and quiet in my bed now, which is good. Yay! Might seem impossible to stay focused at times when we are so separate from one another. Action feels to be terrible thing because really what we need is basic human interaction. As you can see, these are the ones that are going to be hung, as usual, uh, as I've got one right here that's already done, but uh, these have a direction that they need to stay up, I don't know if you can see that, but that says E, and if you can read E as E, is the right way up. Now, what I do normally with the ones that are uh, with the chain, screwed in the side, we find the right measurement from the top to come down to make the hole. Now, I am standardizing this as 275, uh, just because the batten comes down around about 200 from the top of the panel. And as we get lower, the chain's gonna come down at about a 75 mil at an angle to the screw mounting point. So as we mark, 275 here, you might be able to see. It's going to go roughly in the center and then find the center, which on these panels is 62 and a half. So we've got a little cross. Once that's set, and the pen is dying, of course, that's all good. Um, we flip it around and do it again. And mark the next one. I'm going to swap my pen for a Sharpie, because I think that's going to be better. Not sponsored by Sharpie, but hey, something better. Alright, and there you go. Pardon me, I had a pen trip in my mouth. So we go 75 down, 275, and we find the center, which would be. 62 and a half, about there, that's pretty good, that's pretty good. All right, so we have our two spots on either side. So the chain we're using is this jack chain, I don't know if you can see that, but uh, it has a direction, so this will be the back of the chain. <laughs> And we pick four loops of this, is what I've standardized to, uh, just because it makes it all consistent. Um, and as we unloop this, eh, we want to keep it somewhat closed enough, enough to get it off the loop. Then we check it with one of the eye hooks to see if an eye hook's going to move smoothly in, but have not too much of a tolerance that it's going to fall out. We get the screw. We put the screw in. Now this is a hex screw and it's nice and chunky. It's a self-tapping screw, so we don't need to drill a pilot hole. And a washer on the other side, so that we can get a nice clamping force. 
Now this is set really slow because I'm not going to cut the material in any way. I'm just going to go straight in because I found even if I drill a pilot hole for the through the material or try and cut the material, it's still going to snag on the screw. So it's better just to go straight in and nice and slowly with it because eventually it's going to snag a little bit. There it is. There's the snag. So you just slowly back it off a bit and give it a bit more and ease it in until the center thread snaps and breaks and you don't get too much ripping or stretching or these ladder lines in the material. It takes a little bit sometimes. And there we go. And what I've done is I've set the ratchet on the driver to be quite low so that we don't over tighten and rip out the very soft poplar ply uh, underneath. And as you can see, it's stopping. As I hold it at a 45 degree angle, just so that it'll kind of rest where it's going to be anyway. Um, and we flip around and we'll do the other side. So we've moved everything around in the room at the moment. Hooray, uh, everything's open because we're about to start this wall. We figured, luckily, uh, if we put the batten right underneath this picture rail uh, and screw it in, that'll give us the perfect height for us to start mounting the next uh, set of five from the centre. So we can start in the middle and then work our way out to the sides. So I've got the battens marked here, which is this, and I just started marking the points from the outsides. As you can see, the picture rail is now up. Well, the hooks and the battens. So we've just basically gone all the way along to keep it as straight as possible. We've got one joint in the middle and a screw, which we missed. Uh, hooks are on, and now it's time to attach all the hooks to these and chains and then we can put them up. Mounted. Now we've just also mounted another batten underneath, which will have two of these sideways. Yes. Now we've put in uh, these corner ones at the top, we've hung them, and we've also put the ones in the ceiling. Uh, what's weird at the moment is somehow the bounce has just gotten worse than it was before without the things in the corner. We're still going to put the ones on the ceiling because that's where the bounce is coming from. Um, and by the bounce, I mean the boing sound like you are standing in a carport. Um, so I'll just show you what I mean. Uh, it's really subtle. If you can hear it, you might not be able to hear it at all, but.
Today was a tough one. A lot of work, a lot of thapping about, a lot of frustration. But we have our ceiling ones done and we've replaced a light. Right there. Ooh, lens flare, yay. Um yeah. Yeah, it's sounding deader in this bit. And now we've just got to do the last half of the ceiling. And that should really kind of be a final drastic change in terms of audio to this room. Because once that's in, then we've just got to put this here. And we're going to put one here. And we've got to put one up there and one on that door. So there's only 
Eight more to go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Ah, ah, ah. Um, yeah. I guess the next shot you'll see is me putting them in. Okie dokie. So, uh, I had to change the layout because, uh, originally, the one that was uh, meant to hung diagonally, hung on, meant to hang diagonally right here, uh, is too long to fit between this panel and this door. Which means that, um, basically, I have to uh, do just another layer of five, another row, like so. And you look up into the light, you've got the one, two, three, four, and five. And we're just going to put it here. One, two, three, four, and five. <sighs> but that was a pretty quick decision, and uh, hopefully the colors don't look trashy. But what are you going to do? Nothing. So. Yeah. We have finally put in, behind me, the ones that are mounted on the door. What we did was, we just put some angle brackets and just mounted them straight onto the wood. And up the top we did the same, but the other way, if you can see that. And we have a broadband absorber and a diffusive uh, binary diffuser, I think it is a D shape, which is similar to that one right there. And guess what? We're done. Time to um, calibrate the speakers and have a listen. Yay! So, um, now we're ready to check it out and hear how it sounds. Uh, so I have like a whole set of reference tracks that I listen to on pretty much every speaker system there is. I'll chuck that in the description if you want to use these reference tracks as your own stuff, if you want to check out different systems and different speakers and uh, really learn how these ones sound. But these are songs that I like um, and it's pretty common that every engineer is going to have one. Uh, playlist, that is, <laughs> of, of songs that they like and they understand and they know really well specifically where things are going to go. But this is my first uh, listening of um, these reference tracks and unfortunately you probably won't be able to hear them due to the YouTube copyright. Uh, but 
just know that that's what I'll be listening to. I'll probably put some other music here and I'll give you my first impressions after we do this. So here we go. That is, to me, that's Guthrow's yeah. masterpiece. Yeah. Now everything is in the room, and after I've used it for a little while, um, I've kept it, I've had a couple of weeks since everything's been installed, and the gradual increase in audio quality, um, as, I, as I kept putting panels in the room, was just outstanding, <laughs> to say the least. It's, uh, it's amazing how much more I can hear uh, in the music, not in terms of necessarily parts, but in terms of hearing compression, hearing uh, reverb tails, hearing like characteristics of specific microphones, even hearing small things where you'll hear like in one of your favorite recordings, you listen to a lot, you'll start hearing like studio noise in the background, like little clicks from hi-hat pedals or like... Um, stick hits or sniffs or some small things um even like little, little lip um whatever they're called uh, the asmr thing <laughs> lip smacks that's the one um even i mean as it's my bedroom <laughs> sleeping in this room has been way better but uh beyond that i after mixing a few things in this space as well immediately uh i was able to bring my mixes up to a higher level because I knew exactly what I was hearing. I wasn't hearing any muddiness. I, I, everything I could hear was just so clean and pristine. And that's partly due to the speakers that I have, but coupled with the room. Now, I, I bought these speakers because they had uh, room correction software uh, built into them, like d digital sound processing along with some 3D internal algorithm stuff inside them. They're, they're really quite high-tech, but um, basically they would listen to the room and then adjust the speaker's phase correlation and EQ curve to match and level out the audio you're hearing so that you're not getting anything wrong. But now I've got quite a acoustically treated room, uh, somewhat well now, uh, I would hope so. It's so they're not working as hard, so they're only making the slightest of adjustments now. And the most important thing is that the phase to the listening point, which is actually right about uh, where my head is at the moment, um, that single spot is almost like this pristine wonderland of like. Uh, mind palace <laughs> uh, in terms of audio like I can close my eyes and in the right mixes and when I hear a really good mix it's just uh, transcendent 
sometimes. And I know it's hard to sort of describe that feeling, but imagine if you've ever done a VR headset, or if you've ever gone to a shopping center, or if you own a VR headset, that's what it feels like now. Um, with reverb in the rooms that I'm like, with the reverb in the, the music <laughs> that's been chosen and the atmosphere and the care it's been taken to place, uh, place instruments where they need to be and vocalists, it's, I can finally hear the artistic intention behind uh, what producers have done and engineers have done in their music. And in my own creative mixing, um, I can hear my, my artistic intentions better, uh, making sure that when I put something either high, low, for forward, back, um, I can hear the reverb tails clearer because there's less reverb in my room muddying it up. I'm even hearing, uh, like, noise in recordings better. It, it's crazy. Anyway, that's enough um, waxing lyrical about audio quality. Um, as much as I've spent in this room, it is, by all accounts, the best money I have spent so far. Like, microphones, sure, outboard gear, that's great, awesome. But um, now I can finally hear things properly, and I can hear what my outboard gear is doing better. Um, and to a certain extent, uh, I feel more comfortable mixing in this space than ever before. And I feel confident in what I'm sending out now that it's not going to be, there aren't going to be any weird issues. It's always now going to be, a, uh, any, any issues that arise will be a creative issue uh, in the mix as opposed to a technical issue in the mix. Uh, now on to, speaking of which, the monitor. Um, I changed my monitor from this huge thing uh, to a slightly less huge thing due to the fact that as I was, uh, after treating my room and as I was listening to music, I heard this kind of like whistle, um, like sound as a sheen over everything. And what I did was I put my hands and I'll show you what I did. Um, I was listening to the audio and I put my hands just to the left hand side of the speakers. Uh, well, not the insides of the speakers, just a block where the screen would have reflected directly back at me. Um, and I, it got rid of that whistling noise. So I moved my hands around just so I could block the spots where it would have been reflecting audio. Well, my assumption was is that the speakers, while they do fire in a very... Um, these speakers in particular... They fire a uh, high frequency and high mids directly in a very narrow cone, uh, whereas some speakers will fire more wider dispersion uh, of high of mid mid high, mid high mid and high frequencies. <laughs> um, but what I what I perceived was happening, and what I think was happening, was that the one kilohertz to two and a half kilohertz maybe um, was reflecting off my face and into this concave screen. And then acting as though it was like a concave lens, like when you look into a spoon, but with audio. And it would pass and reflect the audio across and then back to me in the wrong ear. But that was around the 1 and 2, two kilohertz range. So everything else was being absorbed into the room, except this other sound that was coming straight back at me. Um, so that's something to keep in mind if you're treating your own room is no matter what, there will always be a surface um, that will be reflecting back at you in an undesirable way, and it will be your computer screen, and sometimes even your desk. So, that is something to think about uh, as you design your own spaces. And as much as having a big screen was really fun, and I got a lot of productivity done, and I was able to see all my channels, I can get basically the same amount from this. It's got less of a curve to it. Um, unfortunately, getting big screens, they, I, I can't find one without a curve these days. Um, but I, at this stage, it's so negligible, I don't think it's going to matter. Anyway, I hope you have enjoyed uh, the process that I've gone through in order to um, enhance my listening space as best as I can in a bedroom, um, which is a lot of people's uh, reality, is that 
A lot of mixes these days are coming out in a bedroom. A lot of produced songs are going to come out by being mixed in a bedroom. And look at Billie Eilish. They mixed that entire album uh, uh, that came out, what, 2019, 2020? Entirely in their house. And it won Best Mix at the Grammys. So there's nothing wrong with mixing at home. Um, and for me, this just makes me more comfortable and confident. So give it a try. And uh, good luck. I'll see you next time.